Good morning and welcome to a live talk program. This is Lord Grubb here, your host on Revive Reform Radio, doing our live talk program covering the importance of church on your Tuesday morning, rise and shine and give God the glory. And this morning here, we're looking at the topic, the fast that God has chosen. So what is the fast that God, that God has chosen? And we're looking at our li um, live talk program here covering the importance of church as we look at fasting and um, the upcoming Lent celebration. So this is what we're looking at here this morning as we do our live talk program here. Welcome again and hopefully at a blessed night rest. Let us pray. Our Father, word in heaven, we thank thee again, dear Lord, for your love. We thank you, dear Lord, for the blessings of your word. And we thank you, dear Lord, for all that you do for us. I pray that you may be with us as we study and talk together this morning here. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking at this topic here. As you know, um, this time of the year, <clears throat> around this time of the year, is the celebration of what we call Lent. And Lent is normally celebrated um, mainly by Catholics as You'll see a cover here in a second, but more and more Protestants are ce celebrating a Lent. Um, so Lent is something that is celebrated 40 days before Passover or the Crucifixion Week or Weekend. Uh, so normally this is what happened. And so it is encouraged, as I'll read in a second here or a few minutes here, it's encouraged to give up um, um, something uh, for that time of the year. So give up something, um, uh, it's something out of your life that is probably bad for you. And normally it's, it kicks off the first day of Lent will be, uh, February 14th and it's normally kicked off with Ash Wednesday. So it is, Ash Wednesday is normally a day. It's a day when, um, which is a day when they put ashes like in a cross on the forehead and then normally it's a it's like a mashup of a few different things because Lent is forty days. So forty days is this idea where you know Christ, Moses, various different people will fast for forty days, um, or abstain from food and so forth for forty days. So they took that and tag it on to the front end of the Passover. And then normally in the Old Testament, when there was a fast. Um, people get um, up in a dress, a dress like sackcloth and ash ashes, and so they'll put that ashes on the forehead. And then also in fast, you normally would um, give up something. No pleasant food will come across your mouth. So it is at a time when it is encouraged for Christians to do that. So it's kind of a mashup of a few things in the Bible in the Old Testament that is done. And so normally it starts on Wednesday. Um, as I say, February 14th will be that date. And then it goes into the a crucifixion weekend or the passion weekend. So a few things there that is mashed up together and normally create this idea of what we call um, Lent. So here um, I'm going to start off by just reading um, one um, passage of scripture here before I go into um my my article right so i'll read isaiah to start isaiah chapter um 58 verse 5 isaiah chapter 58 verse 5 and my topic for this morning here is the fast that god has chosen in isaiah 58 verse 5 through 8 it read is it such a fast that i've chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and and to open and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him. Will thou call this a fast, an acceptable day of day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the band of wickedness, to undo the heavy burden, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bringest the poor that are cast out into thine house? Um, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health spring forth speedily. And thy righteousness shall go before thee, 
the glory of the Lord shall be thy re reward. So here the, the Bible outlines are uh, very fascinating that this is the Old Testament. This is where you get a lot of the, lot of the idea of fasting with sackcloth and ashes. Um, this idea of fasting for 40 days, all that. And Isaiah put forward this um, thing that to Israel, and this is Israel in its deep rebellious state, that what the Lord is looking for is some correction to fast from what you benefit from. There's some true fast. Because as you know with fasting, fasting is very beneficial. If you want to be able to regain some self-control, if you want to maintain proper health, fasting can be quite beneficial. But this is something that is benefiting you. Here Christ says that the things that needs to be focused on is moral fast, where you're doing something to bless and benefit somebody else and to stop hurting and causing pain. And so we're going to focus on that this morning here, um, what type of fast the Lord has chosen. And as we say here, the fast that God has chosen is more fast from, right, from, from wickedness and to do the right thing, to bless others, to help others, um, doing things to other, for others that you get back in no return. The only blessing is that you receive a blessing from the Lord. So I have this article here I want to share with you, very fascinating stuff. As um, This is simply a survey I'm going to read to you from Christi um, Christianity Today. And it's talking about um, every year there's a survey or various different groups like Barna and stuff do surveys and they do surveys to find out what are people fasting from and so the um, things that people fasten from some of it is quite interesting some of it is quite comical but it, it is still nonetheless what's happening in our Christian world and in our world in general so the title of the article is what to give up for Lent 2018 consider Twitter top 100 ideas um, so last year, Trump ranked between Facebook and Hope. So some people, I guess, was going to give up Facebook and some was going to give up Hope and then some was going to give up Trump. Um, so that's the article, the beginning here. So once again, you can follow in real time what Twitter users say they are giving up for Lent, which this year begins Wednesday, February 14th. Last year, food items were three times as popular to abstain from as technology items uh, or personal habits. According to the 73,333,000 tweets analyzed by OpenBible.info, um, Stephen Smith during the week of Ash Wednesday, 2017, alcohol rank, ranked number one. <laughs> Sorry for that. Alcohol rank number one for the first time since this his project began 2009. This year, creator of Twitter, um, Lent Tracker, says he, ex he expect relationship-related um, tweets to run higher than usual because Hash Wednesday coincide with Valentine's Day. Also, Easter coincide with April's Fool's Day. Fool's Day. And so um, I was noticing that over the weekend, that this year, um, April Fool's Day, um, April 1st, most naturally, is um, on a Sunday, I think it is. And it's the same day that they will be having, um, what do you call it, um, Easter. And so, and then Ash Wednesday uh, is February 14th, which is Valentine's Day. So I guess we'll see if um, they're prognostication or their forecasting works out where um, people will be giving up um, a lot of things to do with relationships. So those come up. So in your summit was most curious last year about how high Donald Trump would rank among um, perennial favorites such as social network, alcohol, and chocolate. The president ended up finishing at number 22 in 2017 up from number 82 in 2016. So I guess more people are giving him up. Meanwhile, um, LifeWay Research offered a chance to compare Twitter's serious versus sarcastic shares, sharers last year via its study on what American Americans who observed the Lent season before Easter says in uh, they actually give up. Um, of note, three out of 10 Americans with evangelical beliefs, 28%, 
say they observe Lent. 42% typically fast from a favorite food or beverage, while 71% typically attend church service. Catholics remain the most likely to observe Lent, 61%, with two out of three fasting from their favorite food or beverage, 64% of all those who respond. Overall, one in four Americans observe Lent, 24% of Americans, according to LifeWay. Most Americans observe fast from a favorite food or beverage, 57%. Or a bad habit, 35%. Or a favorite activity, 23%. Hispanics were the most lightly ethnic group to observe Lent, 36% of all Hispanics. And were more likely than whites to abstain from a favorite activity, 34% versus 17 Or bad habits, 50% versus 34 in 2014, Barna Group found that 17% of U.S. adults planned to fast during Lent, including 63% of practicing Catholic and 16% of practicing Protestants. So that's important to note here, just a little pause here, that 63% um, of Catholics practice this, um, but... Um, it is primarily, it is interesting that 16% of Protestants, because it's one of, one of those activities that Protestants really didn't get involved in. But more and more, um, Protestants are doing um, Lent, and, um, and then they're doing um, even other things similar to that because normally if you do Lent then the question is do you kick it off with Ash Wednesday which is kind of seem logical to a certain degree because normally as I say fasting was always associated with ash with sackcloth and ashes I don't know if they do the sackcloth part though because you're reading here uh, skip a little bit in this article so most were giving up food items including chocolate meat soda and alcohol beverages which is which is important as I was saying when I'm gonna get back to Isaiah chapter fifty eight that it, that type of fast is is just good period for anybody fasting is is good um, very beneficial this type of fast you know somebody say I'm gonna fast of chocolate which is gonna be interesting because the big day for chocolate is Wednesday um, Valentine's Day so anyhow if people are gonna fast of chocolate. Uh, that's not a bad thing. That's actually beneficial to them. See, but when you're fasting and you say, well, if I'm going to fast for the next 40 days and the next 40 days, I'm going to help the poor. I'm going to pay more money to my workers. I'm going to take care of those who are around me. That type of fast is the fast that the Lord wants. That's what the Lord relish. You know, the Bible says, and we'll read it in a second here, a few minutes, that the Lord does not want to sacrifice when he wants his obedience. He wants us to love each other. And so this is self-love. Um, cloaked, but it's not. It's not a bad thing. As I say, I believe in all kind of fast. If you can fast on a water fast, on teas, you can fast on fruit juice, on raw fast. Um, you know, cleansing your body. That's gonna do good for you, even though you're gonna feel some pain, but you're gonna get some beautiful gains. So I love the idea of fasting. Period. Um, and this is often the thing. It's like. A lot of these things, they're, they're really selfish motivation, motivated, but it seems like a person is sacrificing something, but it's for their good. Um, but true fast is really for, to bless others. And so we're going to talk more about that. So people fast off soda, alcohol, these are the things that people fast. So chocolate, 30%, meat, 28%, soda, 26%, and alcohol, 24%. All those things are good to fast off. Very beneficial for one's life. Now, below is Smith um, running tally of the top 100 most mentioned Lenten sacrifices, both serious and cynical, in 2018. This list eventually covered all tweets from February 11th through 17, right? So they're doing just the this week normally they cover. Mention given up um, to Lent and accept noted exclude excluded tweets so let me just jump over here to the article fresh so i can see some of these charts um online so before i go down to that one that i just read about so most actually they say for food 
are for um, Twitter five lentil choices have proven consistently popular by Smith tracking that began in 2009. So what people fast off consistently is alcohol, social networking, chocolate, Twitter, and chips. And so chips um, is always an interesting thing that so many people have to literally like sacrifice chips because <laughs> I guess you you can't eat just one chip you have to eat the whole bag. Um, so here goes that. So alcohol, social media network. You know none of these things. If you social media, I guess it's like um, Snapchat, Facebook, and so forth. They do Twitter as a separate category. So anyhow, that's one group. Um, different. This is the trend in over time. The trend in over time. What people fast from from 2009 to 2018 is people. I guess the top choice is fast food. So sweet chips, cookies, shopping is another thing that people decide to fast from for the last next 40 days. Um, I don't know if people giving up sleep. Sleep, it says there. I don't understand that. Are probably they trying to get more sleep? Oh, they gave up sleep probably. I don't know. Being mean and swearing, people fast from that. That's a good one. Complaining, people fast from that for 40 days. That's beautiful. Somebody for a whole 40 days decide no complaining. Um, they fast from their cell phone and selfies. So for 40 days, no cell phone and no selfies. And then at the bottom of that list there, people fast from sex and masturbation. On... And so those are the lists. So anyhow, so here's the bigger list before I get back to um, more serious talk here for what people are going to be fasting from. And I want to read this list to you because I want to get into the topic of the fast that God has chosen. So I'm just reading this to you. This is the top 100. I'm going to read probably 30 just to kind of set the, the mindset. So social networking is number one. So I find it fascinating that social networking people really... I guess they see it as a necessary, it's an evil or something that they probably do too much. They're, they're too addicted to it and they need to fast. So the number one set of tweets that says that they need to fast from social networking, whether that they did it or not, for 40 days was number one. Number two, alcohol. Next is Twitter. So Twitter is always separated from social networking. <laughs> Or probably because they're on Twitter, they said they just need to fast from that. So probably that's social networking is probably really the number one thing. Chocolate, meat, swearing, negativity, sweets, soda, coffee, Snapchat, fast foods, sugar, bread, men. So men came in at number 15. So I guess a lot of women think they need to fast from men. Hopefully these are not men also say they need to fast from men. Um, Facebook, school. People need to fast from school. That's strange. Lent, sex, boys. So men and boys come in very high. Marijuana, chips, cheese, Instagram, college, booze, smoking. Carbs, you, junk. All right? Junk food. So food becomes constantly on the list. Food and alcohol are constantly on the list. And then the list just goes on. So you can go on there. It's on Christian Post. It's at the bottom. No, Christianity Today, sorry. The article is found. I pulled it from there. It's at the bottom of its main page. And you can see just a lot of things. People want to fast from hope. I don't know why people want to fast from hope. People want to fast from church for 40 days. And so most of that is, some of it is just, I guess, comic relief. So that's the, the thing here. So some of it, as I say, is, is, it's, it's something to make you laugh. I guess it's a joke. Um, people want to fast from Jesus. This is all the stuff that goes up on there. So this is probably why people need to fast from social media sometime. So I read this list to you because I want to show you in general um, what some, to a certain degree, I guess, because some of it, as I say, is, is a comic relief. Uh, is what people are fasting from. So then the question here in my mind now, um, topic here is the fast that God has chosen. What God want us to fast from, right? In my understanding of the Bible, because you know in the Bible, fast is something that's always there, but it's something that is in the Bible every time there was 
massive problem in Israel. Lord will encourage you to profit, rend your heart, but not your garment. Um, break forth in mourning and not singing. Lord will say to the people to dress yourself in sackcloth and ashes. Um, so make yourself all ashy and, um, you know, cut back from food um, and so forth. And so it's in the Bible. But then, you know, like with human beings, us human beings, we can take everything that is even supposed to be for positive good and we make it become a ritual. It is fascinating what people could make a ritual. Somebody do something and it's very sacrificial and then not everybody's into it. And you think, no, 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 that was supposed to be to get oneself prepared for righteousness. And now it becomes like a just a formality that people go through and um, and it, it become perverted. So very important to note that is it's not that these things doesn't have a value. As I say, if more people would fast from fast food and sodas and um, and alcohol and social media and all this type of stuff and all the other craziness that people put there, you know, pornography and all that stuff, it, they would be better for it. Society would be better for it. There's no question. There would be less sick people, especially coming out of the Christmas season where people get so sick. And now we're in the flu season, you know, fasting is a good thing to kind of clean out the body. But when we talk about fasting and we're talking about religious fast, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not a bad thing. It's just how we can take something that's supposed to be for good reasons. And then, like what we read in the beginning from Isaiah 58, God has to readjust the people. Because the people become, to take something that is of some value and they make it become just a ritual. So in Mighty chapter 9, verse 11 through 17, I'm going to read this to you here. I'm going to read some of the passage of scripture just to kind of set the note to me on what a true fast is and how many of these things are just, they're just simple traditions of men. They're not true biblical counsel of how to live your life. And when you see, you'll see what I'm talking about. So in Mighty 9, verse 11 through 17, it says, And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciple, Why eat? Eat at your master with publicans and sinners. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. So they that behold need not a, phys a, a physician. Uh, when you think about a fast, right? You think about it that many times when there was a call for a solemn um, feast or a solemn fast or something solemn. It was not because it was a crisis. It, it wasn't just something to do for doing sake. You know, we're just going to fast. Or we're going to call for solemn assembly. It was normally for a purpose. And it's a similar idea with a doctor. You could do a wellness checkup and there's nothing wrong with that. But when you really need a doctor is when you're sick. And so things can become routine. And when it's routine often it doesn't have the same value as when it's a, it's in the real it, there's a need and so some of this i think is come from just taking basically i think ignoring the emergencies that are around us and just fasting for fasting's sake and then it becomes something of this oh yeah next year this time of the year we do ash wednesday we do lent we don't do it but i'm just saying they just do Ash Wednesday to do Lent. And there is no real emergency. There's no real need. And then you see somebody say, why are you fasting? Uh, I'm fasting, you know, I'm giving up chocolate. And that's what you're fasting about. With all the madness going on in the world, that's that's your focus of this fast. Is to give up chocolate. So here Christ says, it is the issue, some, it's issue often or almost all the time, is the issue is, are you sick? Are you in need? Because when a person is in need, they act differently and their behavior is different. I, I remember a doctor, a natural doctor I used to deal with. He said to me, Lloyd, you know, I prefer a person is able to walk into my office than to be wheeled in. Because normally when they're wheeled in, they're probably just too sick to really get some of the benefits because they're probably on the way out. So at least being able to walk in. But I do not like... I prefer a person who is very sick that they're in a point where they almost they will do just about anything because often when I'm going to ask them to drink and to eat and the type of thing I'm going to ask them to do they're going to have to be in need 
you see, but a person who is not in need and they're not in a desperate situation, it is difficult to get them to move. Some will, but most won't. You know, unless probably they're trying to be, be a bodybuilder or be bare fit. You have to have a need. And when you have a need, whatever is prescribed is more received. It's more you are willing to receive it. So this is why I think sometimes just having many things that just happen on a cyclical basis. We're just going to do this next. It can become um, just so trite, you know, just so um, meaningless and vain. So even Christ, as he was preaching, those who were the publicans, they had a need. They saw their great need because they were great sinners. But those who were the Pharisees and started religious leader, they didn't have a need because they were good. This is why it's difficult to preach the gospel to people who have too much money or they live in too much good life. But when people get desperate, they're willing, they want, to, want somebody to save them. You know, you can't throw a lifesaver to somebody that's on the deck of the boat. You throw that to a person that's in the water. And now the lifesaver becomes very valuable to them. They hang on to it. But you throw it to somebody on the deck of the boat, they're going to be like, what, what's that for? So here it says this day that are sick. Verse 13, but go ye and learn what that mean. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I'm not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. I will have mercy, not sacrifice. See, this type of thing here, the right is not probably not the wrong idea per se. And these things, they probably born not from a bad idea, but they become quickly the traditions of men and become useless because the focal point becomes wrong. I will have mercy. The focal point of these fasts is to have mercy. Think about it. Normally, the fast was called is that Israel was gonna get, was about to get a beat down. The enemies was right at the gate, and they would be like, "Wow, we didn't do right, and stuff is about to hit the fan. I need to make make my life form straight, and I need to plea with God for what I need, the blessings I need." So this is supposed to be the concept of a fast. And keep reading here. Um, verse 14 says, Then came to him the disciples, is, um, then came to him the disciple of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the day will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and they shall, and then they shall they fast. No man put so I'll pause, pause there because he's going to go to another teaching very quickly. So when you have, as I say, when you have a situation where if you don't need a fast, then the fast is just something become okay routine. We fast this time of the year. Uh, this you know as I say in the Bible, this type of fast was there for a reason. Moses is about to receive the Ten Commandments and he goes into a deep fast, deep concentration because he's going to be presented before the Lord. Or he's going to present himself before the Lord. This is not something that's just happening because it's time. It's a cyclical. As I say, everything that we do that becomes cyclical can become so um, so vain and meaningless. It becomes just traditional. It is so weird. Uh, you think about it again with Christ. When Christ did the 40 days, he was about to go up into, into um, a battle with Satan, a massive battle. It was, he had to do this before he started his public ministry. And so when he did that, it become more meaningful. And I'm not promoting here that we need to do any 40 days, anything um, per se, or not. I'm just simply saying the idea of this concept here that when things are done and it's just done, for flippant reason. And what are you going to fast for? Um, or what are you going to give up? You know, it, it, it is, it is, I'm going to give up something that's going to benefit me. Great. But that's not what it's always about or should be about. Verse 16 says, No man put at a piece of new cloth, cloth unto an old garment, for that which is put in to, to fill it up Take it the garment and rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottle break and the wine run it out, and the bottle perish, 
but they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved. So what Christ here is saying here is that the way that you did church or doing church is based upon these traditional things that you even pull out of the Bible. They might seem like biblical tradition. And now here Christ come and Christ is doing church a certain way. And for them, they find it to be a problem because both don't go together. You see? And so they're they're looking at what Christ is doing and say, John's, John's disciples, which is really still still pharisaical in a certain way because they're still, although they're separated to a certain degree from the Pharisees, they still do some of the traditions of the Pharisees. So they're looking at Christ and they're like, wow, you guys do it different. And he said, why do you do that? And Christ says, you know, it's just a method. I'm, why would you be fasting now? I'm here. The time is coming where there's going to be a need for a fast. If you think about the day of Pentecost, they would have been in a state of sackcloth and ashes, the disciples, after the death of Christ. Not 40 days before Christ died, but 40 days, 50 days, sorry, after Christ died. So the bridegroom was here, and as the bridegroom was here, Jesus Christ was here on the earth, the days going up, he was not in a fast mode. Um, he was in a fast, but it was a different type of fast. Now, it's a fast that I read in the beginning. is the fast with Isaiah. The fast that he was doing was a fast where he was focused on righteousness. If he did without food, it was, it was more, he said, because I have the master will to do. I need to preach while it's still day. So he's in an urgent mode. He's just blessing people. That was the fast. And you, if you read Isaiah, as I say, which we're going to read by God's grace before we close here. You see that Christ's fast was not a gimmicky fast. He was not giving up chocolate and alcohol. No, that was already like a given. He was trying to bless the people. And his disciples were having a great time because even the demons listen to their voice when they claim the, the name of Jesus. And they were like blown away. Things were great. The ministry was popping. Everything was good. And things start going downhill, not 40 days before Christ's um, ascension, so to speak, or death. Um, but it was more when they grabbed Christ that Thursday night and they realized, whoa, Things are going to really go bad. Because remember, even before that, the Sunday, they were trying to put Christ on the throne. They were celebrating. Not 40 days before. 40 days before, things were great. Even though some of the disciples had dropped out, they're thinking, man, one is going to sit on the left, one is going to sit on the right. Hurrah. Everything is great. And so Christ keep on telling them, hey, look, things are not great. Trouble is coming. So when they grab Christ, Peter decide, I'm going to chop somebody up. And then led to deny the Christ. Then Christ died. And then for the next how many days, they're in fear now. Similar to the Jews when they were, would be surrounded by an army in the Old Testament. Or when sin got out of control and things are just so bad that the elders would have to call for a fast. So here they are now in the upper room. And instead of for 40 days, they were there for 50 days. They were there for the whole period of Pentecost. And then they were ready to receive the Holy Spirit. And then he came, you know, here's the proverbial, um, you know, line where there's things go up and they go down and they go up. And, you know, it was an up and down because one moment they're converting souls, souls next moment they're being hunted because people want to kill them for preaching Jesus. So when we see here, Christ make it very clear that you can, what Christ is doing is a departure from what the Pharisees are doing. And so the two of them don't mix. And so the methodology don't work because now is the time to get certain things done. And people are going into the mode as if they're after the fall of the, say, U.S. Constitution. I don't know if that makes sense to you. They're, fun they're functioning one way when there's a way to function another way. So Christ says, no, 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 no. My ministry and your ministry don't mix. You're over there doing your fast business. we over here celebrating the victories of the Lord. All right. So let's go to Matthew 23, verse 23 through 28. 
So it's a time period. What is supposed to be happening now? And it's the same thing. This ritualistic stuff don't make no sense. And they end up running us into a lot of problems. Because they become just like tradition. Like, why, why, what are we doing? Oh, I think now, let's check the calendar. Oh, yeah, now we're going to do Ash Wednesday. You feel ashy about anything? <laughs> and they be like, nope. I don't feel ashy about anything. But anyhow, they tell me to give up something. So I give up something. You see, but if a person comes now and it's the middle of May. And they'll be like, man, I feel like I'm dying. And I say, yeah, it's probably time for you to give up all that red meat. That here goes the beginning of your Ash Wednesday. You see, it has more meaning because there's a need. But just doing something for tradition's sake, it make it become trite, to make it become meaningless. Now, in my 23, verse 23 through 28, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You know, these are actors. This is all an act. And you can go, <laughs> you could go in and see them going through this act. And it's really an act. Come, here comes your hash. And you get your hash. It's just like, this is a joke. Anyhow, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These you these ought ye to have done and not leave the others undone. So they're very sticklers, you know, they're very rigid, rigid when they come on to certain things. And, and you deal with these Pharisees, they're always like that. And, you know, they they'll fight you over one thing and then a thousand things are falling apart. And they think, Oh, we we special. <laughs> so he says verse twenty four, ye blind guides with strain at a knot, knot and swallow a camel. So the little thing you're like, oh man, and they make a big deal out of it, and then the big thing, they like, what's the problem? No problem, everything good, we all good. <laughs> Say woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup, and of the platter, but within are full of extortion and excess. So when you think about Isaiah 58, the type of fast that God has chosen, God says in Isaiah 58. What I want you to do is stop focusing on little small stuff to make the scene, make it looks like everything is clean. Focus on the big things. You strain out a nut and swallow a camel. I need you to, to, to not ignore the nut because I didn't make nuts to eat. But I, I, I want you to not swallow the camel because I didn't make them to eat either. But I need you to obviously tell me that you're more focused on the camel and not so get a big deal over a nut. And as I say, if you've ever eaten an insect, which I'm sure all of us have swallowed an insect or two, we don't know. <laughs> Do you, you, it, it, you know, it's, think about it, it's very easy to swallow an insect. It's harder to swallow a camel. And a person that will swallow a camel is like, what is the matter with you? You make such a big deal over this and all the oppression and wickedness that is going on in the world. You, you don't, you don't lose bad an eye. You, you think about how much they'll go to a, a, an extent many times to defend some of the most wicked, vile people in the society. Side with them and stand with them and all that. And the small things they make a big deal out of. You don't see something bigger there to worry about. You say, okay, I, I don't want to even give too much examples, but you know what I'm saying. I'll give them probably later. But within are full of extortions. You're extorting the people. An excess. In Christ's time, the Pharisees and Sadducees were the prosperity gospel preachers. They were the guys with the big, you know, robes and the big broad in their phylacteries. In the time of the Dark Ages, it was the Catholic priests. They became the prosperity gospel preachers. In our time, the preachers, they just call themselves prosperity gospel preachers. They're bold nowadays. They just come out and say, we're just into money. We love money. So, Christ is saying... You're full of excess. And and yet you, you strain at a gnat over here. Verse 26 says, Thou blind Pharisees, clean first that which is within the platter, the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. So he's saying it is a, the function is different. You see, instead of focusing on making people give up chocolate and fish or chicken or beef or pork, or alcohol, or any of that stuff. Christ said your focal point is to teach a man righteousness. Teach a man to stop being an oppressor. Stop extorting. Stop being a murderer. You can focus on such the small things 
but the little things, the small things you focus on, but the big things get ignored. Verse 27 says, Woe unto you, scribe and Pharisees, hypocrites, because there is all act. For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men bones, and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Some deep-rooted sin that not getting, they ain't overcoming nothing. So this is where again the problem comes in. Here you have a problem where, okay, we're going to do Lent. We're going to do all this stuff. Yeah, but why are you not telling people that said they need to stop this wickedness? All these corporations who are holding up all this money. Why you don't go into the middle of the country and go put some jobs up? Why you don't pay the workers more money? Why you don't fight for the sick to make sure that they have health insurance. Why don't know, why the things that really matter is they're not fasting from that and giving up that. Say we're gonna give up some money, we're gonna we're gonna make make the public happier. Why are you fasting from chocolate and chips? And and I know this is the Twitter people. I'm sure some other people are fasting from something else. See the fast that God has chosen, the fast of righteousness, is to bless your fellow human being. It's a fast where you 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 know some of the fast there was beautiful people said they're gonna fast from being mean and that type of that's what the Lord wants things that are the big deals but what it is is that you think about it how you and you know if you have time tomorrow look at some of the pictures and stuff coming out of Lent you see how beautiful it looks it looks like so righteous where you know people go and get their ashes what they need to do get buckets of ashes and throw on the people. So they can do the sackcloth and ashes and tell them to come to come to come to um, service in burlap bags. Now we're talking. Luke eleven verse thirty seven to forty one. Luke eleven verse thirty seven to forty one again. Christ here speaking. It says here, and as he spake, a certain Pharisees besought him to dine with them, and he went in and sat down to meet. So remember, Christ, although Christ was accused of being a wine bibber because he would sit with the publicans you know publicans you know they, they you can't help it think about it. you go sit with the publicans it's jesus is there but they're still publicans nonetheless so they're gonna behave a certain way uh if we're gonna be good probably <laughs> verse 38 but here christ now is sitting with the pharisees so it, it it is like you know they 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 they're struggling so to speak uh, some of what christ was saying was very difficult for them to take and nothing new. If you preach righteousness, uh, Pharisee is going to struggle with it. Anyhow, and it says here, And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. So this is a kind of ceremonial wa washing from my understanding. You know. He, he wash, but we're just going to take it as it is. Wash his hand. All right. And the Lord said unto him, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter? But your inward part is full of r revenue and wickedness. So you know a revenue is 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 very attacking, very vicious, and wickedness is what it is. So Christ here, most naturally is um, <laughs> he's he's on the ball. Uh, when, as I always say, when Christ is dealing with the regular people, he deals a certain way. When he deals with the Pharisees, religious leader, he is like it's just totally different. It, it, it just goes straight. It just goes straight for it with them. It, his actions is very um, measured with them. With the people, he just teaches, teach them, bless them, heal them, so forth. With the religious leaders who are the ones that are responsible for the system and they're the one responsible for the system to be corrupt because they hold it that way. So Christ deals with them differently. So he don't wash his hand and notice here, to the, you know, you can imagine it's like, it's like, as my wife say, make, make you clutch your pearls. You know, it's like, imagine when they saw Christ didn't wash his hand, he says, he marveled. So you, you, can, you can see the focal point when Christ said they really strained at a gnat and saw a camel. You can tell it's like, what? How could he do this? So Christ basically, you know, as I say, it's a setup. <laughs> so Christ actually know them and know how they're going to behave. I marveled. So verse 39 again. 
And the Lord said unto him, Now do you Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your, so just in case, you know, they would miss it, your inward part is full of revenue and wickedness. So he said, you see the problem here? Instead of focusing on righteousness on the inward, you're focusing on all these externals. As I say, it's not that giving up chocolate or giving up um, school, I don't know how that makes sense, or giving up any of these things, it, it, it has no benefit, but it's minor in comparison to what God wants you to give up. And Christ simply says to him, say, hey, Pharisee, you focus on, you're so shocked that my hands is not washed. You're so shocked, whether it be a natural washing or a spiritual washing. You're so shocked over that. that you marvel. But why are you not so concerned that the inside of a man is all this madness, all this evil? And he doesn't say just your members of your church. He say you Pharisees. What's wrong with you? Why are you not trying to make the gospel wash you within? Because if it's washed within, Christ is simply saying here, the outside is going to get washed. But if the outside is washed, it's not necessarily that the inside is washed. See, one will affect the other, but the other doesn't affect one. So the focal point of false religion was always an external washing. The Jews did it, the Catholics did it, and the Christians does it. It is a human failing, so to speak, I believe. It's humanity that is coming forward here. Humanity gets so focused on externals that they forget that truly it's what's inside the heart. But the flip of that is that whatever is inside the heart will come out on the outside. And we continue for the sake of time. Ye fools. Uh, now remember here, we have to understand it's in context because it is Christ also that said we shouldn't go around calling people fools. Anyhow, so ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within? But rather give alms of such things as you have. And behold, all things are clean unto you. Fascinating, isn't that? Fascinating. Just like the Pharisees marvel. I marvel at that. Look at the pivot that Christ does. Christ doesn't keep talking forever. As a matter of fact, he don't keep talking like me because <laughs> I'm just a student. Uh, he's the master. He pivots so powerfully that it blows my mind. He simply says, Ye fools, do not that which is made, which is made without, or he that makes which what is made without, he also make that is within also. He's speaking for God. By him, all things created, and he's telling you, this is how you do it. How you do it, Jesus? How you get the inside clean? He said, give arms. You said, wait a minute, I don't get that. Oh, why would be giving arms? Why would Jesus just pivot to giving arms? Why doesn't Christ says what you need to do is go on a pilgrimage, go on a retreat, do a revival, do this, do that, sing more songs, pray more. Why does he speak give arms? You see, why does he pick? You see, Christ knows how to hit, hit us where it hurts, so to speak. See, the fast that God has chosen, as we read in Isaiah chapter 48, instead of just saying, I'm going to cut back on some food, cut back on all that, that's all good, but that's beneficial to you. You really want to fast. You really want to crucify the flesh. You really want to sacrifice. He says, help somebody who's poor. Remember now, he's talking to the Pharisees. And he knows the subject well, but he knows the human heart well. The human heart will easier sacrifice and do Lent and Ashwin and all these things if it will benefit them in some ways. But when it's going to be, you give arms, and I know the arms you're giving, for the most part, you have no way of receiving back. As a matter of fact, 99% of the time or 100% of the time, you give arms. A L M S. Arms, you're gonna give it, and it is something that is you're not gonna come back to you. It's really a sacrifice. You see, as I say, you put your money where your mouth is, 
And that's the pivot right there. So if you say to me, Lloyd, you've been target talking for 50 minutes. What is it? You sacrifice something of your own. I'm not, this is not pro anything pro Lent or anything. I'm, it's more against it. It's a frivolity of it. What somebody needs to say, I'm going to give up a thousand dollars. I'm going to give it to the fatherless, the widow. That's the point I'm making here this morning. That is the, what is going to cause the change. Where you start to love your neighbor as yourself. Where you start to look out for those who are less fortunate. So the next few minutes, let's summarize this real quickly. Matthew chapter 15, verse 11 through 20 says, Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth the man, but that which cometh out of the mouth defileth the man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly father had not planted shall be rooted out. Rooted up. Let them alone, they blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. And Jesus said, Are you also yet without understanding? And this is a question after you've asked myself. Am I without understanding? Am I getting it? Notice here, that's why I believe in tithe, tithe and offering. Because you're, you're, you're sacrificing for the good of others. You're saying, look, I'm going to give this, and this is not only going to bless me, but it's going to bless somebody else. But selfishness makes me just... As long as it has something to do with me and benefit me, I'll do it. But if I can't see how it benefit me, I can't do it. And that's where it starts to, it's like it's like give it, it's like a ream. It just starts to gut us from the inside and wash us and clean us from the inside. Because the problem in our, is, the issue that we're facing, the big issue is not giving up chips. It's giving up the internal wickedness that's inside. That would even cause us to eat chips. <laughs> so here, or eat the whole bag, I should say. So here, do ye not understand that once ever enter into the mouth, go it into the belly, and is cast out into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, blasphemy. These are they that, these are, these are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defile it not a man. So Christ here double down. So think about it. Is it the chip that is a problem, the chips or the chocolate or the alcohol is a problem, or is it the issue of lack of temperance? You would say the temperance. So you go where mortify the flesh. That's why Christ comes to us and he says, deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow him. It's going to have to cost you something. But he said, this doesn't make it cost you something. But what you need to do for every cigarette you don't smoke, you take that money and don't save it. You give it away to the poor. You give it away to probably the cancer, cancer research or whatever. Whatever you believe in. It really costs you. You don't get back that money. You give it away. And you, you, that's the picking up the cross. That's when it's going to hurt. And this is where Christ is teaching us. In Exodus 22, verse 21 through 24, we read, Thou shalt neither vex a stranger nor oppress him, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Why am I reading this text? Because this is what, if, if they were calling for this type of fast, Lent would be the tradition of man. You know, it's just what man come up with. But still, you can see the value of it. He says, so, so what? You mean, why we just can't focus on, as I say, giving up boys? Some of these young kids even give up boys. It's good for 40 days, no boy. Uh, it's going to benefit them. But here it's saying, oh no, instead of these religious folk talking about giving up um, chocolate and stuff like that, why not give up something that's really valuable? Why not leave the fire at least for 40 days? If we have 40 days where we're not going to bother you and try to deport you and all that type of stuff. Only the ones that are doing criminal activity. And we ain't going to vex you. If we if you're getting paid and we know you really should be getting $10 an hour, $10 an hour, and you're only getting, say, $6 an hour, we're going to pay you. For the next 40 days, you're getting paid $10 an hour. We're going to pay you your fair, wa fair wages. That's when Christ has said that would deal with the heart because the heart is greedy, love money, and that would hit where it hurts. And that would be a true fast. That would increase righteousness in the land. 
if the murderers decide, say, well, you know, for 40 days, I ain't going to kill nobody. I, I could not argue with that. But not just is the concept of a mishmash of stuff in the Bible that is not ordained of the Lord. But it, it's, it's done in a frivol frivolous way that it, it doesn't have the value. Verse 22, same chapter 22, 22 of Exodus, it says, Ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless. If thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. And my wrath shall wax, wax hot, and I will kill you with a sword, and your wives will be widows and your children fatherless. So Christ is saying here, this is what we ought to do. So the, this is the type of fast the Lord is calling for. A fast from wickedness, in other words. A fast from immorality. A, and a, even a fast from food and, as I say, alcohol and all that stuff. This is the type of fast that will bless the people. So I'll read it again in Isaiah chapter 58, verse 5 through 8. Is it such a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes unto him? Wilt thou call this a fast, an acceptable day of the Lord? So as I say, this is part of what they mishmash on Wednesday. They will do Ash Wednesday. And Christ, here Christ Isaiah asks the question, Is this the fast that God wants? Is this the type of fast that God is looking for? He continued question, is not this the fast that I've chosen? What is it now? To loose the band of wickedness and to undo the heavy burden and to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. True fast is a fast to undo the heavy burden, to loose the band of wickedness. Calling for moratorium on people, not just giving up a little thing here, a little thing here. A fast from immorality. This is what a society needs today. More and more, as you see what's happening, it seems like every day, the shooting, the drug overdose, the alcohol deaths, the various different diabetes and um, very different coronary artery problems and the cancer, it is really calling for a fast also from the red meat and the alcohol and the drugs. It's calling though for a deeper fast because of all the bloodshed from immorality, especially the wickedness, the heavy burden, the oppression, the constant greed for a small percentage of the people to pass laws to make it more favorable for them to stay on top and never lose. And even when they fail and they crash the economy, they're proven over and over again. Here comes a bailout of the taxpayer's dollar because they're too rich to fail, to keep them floating. But yet we say there's a free market in the country and that we don't select winners and losers. But yet every time they mess up things themselves, they're able to be bailed out by the government after they mess it up and crash the economy. So then they can't lose because they're too rich to lose. And God says, this is a yoke that needs to be broken. If this was a fast that was being called for, we would see some real change. But the type of fast that we see people are talking about are stuff that I guess is beneficial to them. But the lasting result in their personal life and in the life of the society will not be there. So Christ continued to say here through um, Isaiah, Is it not to deal thy bread to the hunger, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. And so we want this to be our experience. We want to be able to soar high. When we fast, it's nothing wrong to fast from things that are bad for health. This is positive. This is something we promote, I promote, I do. But it's more so even more important that when you're fasting, you seek to bless others. You seek to sacrifice, to give to somebody else. When you do this, this really goes at the selfishness inside of us. goes at the pride inside of us. And it makes us do something for somebody else. And it makes us better for it. And we get the real reward, the real reward and the blessing that the Lord would have us to have. 
May God bless it towards this end. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, again for your love. We thank you for your guidance with your word that we might understand and know what ought not to do, what traditions not to get involved in. And when we do things according to righteousness, that you may continue to bless us and guide us to do it, that it may be meaningful and have meaningful effect for our salvation and for the salvation of others. May you bless us, we pray, as we go through the rest of this day. Thanks again for all that you do for us, for Christ's sake. Amen. Thanks for being with me here on Revive Form Radio. Looking forward to talking to you tomorrow morning where we should talk about natural health. Until then, I pray that you may continue to walk with the King. Mm -hmm.